Good morning. Thanks, Liz. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Rusi team as well. This is a great opportunity for me, and uh, I also want to say I'm a bit humbled to proceed uh, General Sir Gordon Messenger on the podium here. It just shows the strong bond that exists between the two defense establishments. The space enterprise is experiencing extraordinary change, and the themes of today's conference are important for the civil, commercial, and security sectors. The extraordinary change is real, but what's more significant is the rate of pace of change. Every facet of space is marked by actions and activities today that would be unrecognizable only a few short years ago. When I consider the innovation and speed evident across the enterprise, it's altogether fitting that this conference is being held here in the UK and so close to the 77th observance of the Battle of Britain. On Friday, the world will honor the brave aviators who turned the tide of the Luftwaffe and marked the beginning of the end of the Nazi Reich. Just a few short days ago, one of the last pilots from those dark times was laid to rest. Ken Wilkinson, a Spitfire ace from number 19 squadron RAF, passed away at age 99. Indeed, as one of the few, our debt to him was great, but we must also give thanks to the innovators behind the scenes, to men like Tizard and Watt and Wilkins. While the men of Parks Number 11 group did battle above our heads 77 years ago, they were alerted by the series of coastal chain home stations and guided by the controllers in the filter room at Bentley Priory. The actions of this extraordinary group starting in 1935 were truly innovative. They adapted radio fading to air defense. What they did was done in a rapid manner, idea to experiment in just 50 days, and done in a risk managed way. A modest 4,000 pounds, a rapid test, and the willingness to develop a technology less unpromising than a death ray. Much like the development of radar prior to World War II, these elements of innovation, speed, and managing risk are essential elements needed in today's efforts in the space domain. And I'll spend the next few minutes moving us from the 1930s to today. All here know and understand the word Sputnik, and clearly 4 October 1957 marked a watershed moment in space history. Most look backward with nostalgia and what was then always seems more than what is now, and we tend to decry opportunities lost. Interestingly, the beginnings of the space race brought phenomenal engineering feats, but also stark short-sightedness. While teams around the globe pushed the limits, others set limits with their myopic thinking. While NASA was gearing up for man in space with Project Mercury, an internal study from NASA in October of 1958 said that it wasn't necessary for NASA to maintain current ephemerides for all passive satellites, nor would there need to be a vacuum cleaner to remove from orbit satellites that had outlived their usefulness. Why such a stark dichotomy? Is that dichotomy still present today? Many would say yes. Clarity then comes from understanding who was innovating and who was foot dragging and the overall impetus for innovation then and today. It would be wrong to deny the advances accrued given the clash of ideologies between the communist world and the West. Much of the drive for the early dozen years or so of the space race was characterized by this competition. Governments competed and government programs were the norm of the day. Unfortunately, governments mired in bureaucracy and once on a path are slow to change. Innovation in space, long the purview of government entities, has now been supplanted by the commercial sector. Where the governments in the West answered President Kennedy's clarion call in 1961, extraordinary innovation, driven by equal parts vision and profitable returns, is now being accomplished by companies and consortiums pushing the state of technology. Satellite communications likely mark the initial diversion from government hegemony, and connectivity today has become ubiquitous with commercial providers leading governments for the last six decades. 
The industry is also poised for explosive growth with companies like OneWeb, SpaceX, and Boeing investing in constellations numbering in the thousands, bringing capabilities to disadvantaged users numbering in the millions. Led by Surrey and others, breaking through barriers once thought impenetrable, Earth-sensing leaders like Planet now provide worldwide near-instantaneous optical coverage, creating a new Earth landmass image available every 24 hours. Literally terabytes of data, making real Planet's motto, the world is always changing, we just couldn't see it until now. Communications and Earth imaging aren't the only forte of the innovators. Launch and lift have also been turned upside down by companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic. Think about it. We've begun to take a company like SpaceX for granted. It really was just in September 2008 that SpaceX, an unknown startup formed only six years before, successfully launched their first Falcon 1 rocket. The same sort of innovation is resident in the space situational awareness arena. Companies like AGI and ExoAnalytics have challenged the status quo and provide extensive capabilities to detect, detect, track, and catalog space objects. And although we refer to them as non-traditional participants in the game and their sensors and sensor networks as non-traditional, they're quickly supplanting the more traditional capabilities. Efforts are also underway around the globe looking ahead to on-orbit servicing, debris remediation, and zero-g manufacturing, just to name a few. These new space organizations are driving change, bringing a culture and a way of problem solving that gives new meaning to the word innovation. These teams are executing now. While we study, they fly. What does this say about government efforts? What should it say? If government once led, and that leadership was, least, was at least in part competition-based, then we should open our eyes to the challenges present on the world stage. Last year at this very conference, my good friend Major General Clint Crozier talked about our adversary's activities. And in the intervening year, that activity might rightly be characterized as accelerating. We can no longer hide within a belief that operating in space is a benign proposition and that time is our ally. Additionally, in a major theme of this conference, our dependence on space for all aspects of our day-to-day -day lives, as well as for our sovereignty and security, is more apparent today than at any time in our past. So we know that our dependence is high and that the threat is real and growing. The imperative then is to harness the innovative efforts of our commercial partners, realize the impetus that drove our own internal innovation, and recapture our advantages before they slip away completely. The extraordinary activities of new space alone won't solve our dilemmas. Innovation in space, as in many other endeavors, is symbiotically intertwined with speed. We must not only innovate, but we must do so on a pace that keeps us ahead of an agile and thinking adversary. General John Hyten, the commander of the United States Strategic Command and my boss said recently, the vast reaches of space are becoming increasingly crowded and dangerous. That's where our adversaries are going and we need to get ahead of their efforts. But we're falling behind and I know why. We forgot how to move fast. Agility then, speed and purpose must overcome the belief that space remains benign and time is on our side. We can no longer take 10 or 15 years to field new systems only to find that those systems are rigid and unchanged from the requirements and needs described likely two decades earlier. Systems reach the hands of our operators and they're obsolete and unable to respond to the pace of the threat. We can no longer be comfortable about how everything is on a 10 plus year time scale. Why does it take so long to do a mission needs analysis? Why does it take so long to analyze alternative solutions? 
Why is our contracting methodology so slow? Why do we accept requirements creep and cost growth? Why do we get so frustrated with a process that we control that at the end of a decade or so, we accept whatever is thrown over the transom and put it on the backs of the operators to make these half systems operationally relevant? In our own histories, we have examples counter to today's failed endeavors. And in industry today, we have a myriad of examples of rapid action delivering exceptional capability. A moment ago, when I was talking about spacelift, I mentioned SpaceX's Falcon 1 program. And it does stand as an early exemplar of speed and innovation. But I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about SpaceX's Falcon 9. This summer, less than a decade after its first successful Falcon 1 launch, SpaceX launched twice within about 50 hours with Falcon 9s flying from both the east and west coasts, west coasts of the US. East Coast launch included a first stage reuse, and both first stages were recovered autonomously on drone ships in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Let's dwell a moment here. We're not talking about the might of a nation state with decades of space experience and a significant treasury accomplishing this feat. We're talking about a go-fast entrepreneurial company out innovating by leaps and bounds their closest competitors. Simply going to space in so short a time with such a significant capability would have been example enough. But to put on notice the entire space launch world with a reusable first stage and demonstrate that capability 16 times in 19 attempts in a time span measured in months is the yardstick we should all strive to be measured against. I'm sure in the next block, General Messenger will also touch on the overwhelming need to collapse time and rapidly deliver needed capabilities. Let's dig a little bit into Planet's recent satellite efforts. In February, Planet launched on an Indian launch from Sri Hirkota, 88 Dove satellites, bringing their on-orbit total to 149 satellites. This extensive growth has occurred in only the last five years and constitutes simply amazing speed. Planet has presided over advances in miniaturization, manufacturing technologies, automation, command and control, data processing, and dissemination. In short, they've reinvented everything about satellite imagery to make this happen. Again, something like this would have had the traditional space organizations resting on their laurels. But only five months later, Planet launched another constellation of 48 satellites and pulling off a neat trick, imaged their own launch with one of their vehicles launched in February. This, like the other examples, is speed measured in months, not years or decades. If we go back to chain home, we see the same speed and agility. From the early testing in February of 1935, the first five operational stations were in place to defend London by 1937, and by the start of the war, 21 additional stations were operational. To increase speed, Watt's team made extensive use of existing technology, and Watt himself remarked, third best would do if second best would not be available in time and best never available at all. The overall system never remained static with altitude measuring equipment added, the addition of a more extensive human in the loop tactical process, a companion low altitude system, and later nascent computer driven plotting. If we're convinced that innovation is necessary and just as evident today as it was during the early days of the space race, and if we know that we need speed and agility to pace the threat, how do we bring these elements together? And more importantly, how do we do so within the civil and security sectors of government? Over and over again, we have examples from the past and from today's commercial sector where innovation and speed are the order of the day. What's stopping us from capitalizing on this legacy, on this potential? One trait chains us to old think. One trait slows us. One trait delays that necessary future. 
and that one trait is debilitating risk aversion. We're mired in it. It characterizes everything we do, and it will be our undoing if we don't recognize it for what it is and eliminate it from our thinking, from our programs, and from our national efforts. This culture of risk aversion denies us the innovation and speed we need. Our processes add layers of bureaucracy, and at each phase we opt to study and analyze versus decide. We must set our mission needs and boldly strive to achieve them. We must streamline how we acquire, how we test, how we field, and how we adapt to the changing and growing threats. <clears throat> Today our processes are stovepiped, and they must be integrated and flexible. They're slow and lack adaptability, and they must be agile and responsive. And they reward risk aversion when they must be risk tolerant and reward boldness. Decisions must be pushed to the lowest level possible, and authority, responsibility, and accountability must be vested in empowered leaders ready and willing to execute on tactically relevant timelines. General Hyten caused a bit of a stir when he noted that our adversaries are innovating faster because they're less afraid to fail. This unhealthy relationship with failure drives us to decide slowly if we do at all and most certainly stretches out fielding and capability timelines. One example from the past drives this home. Early in the space business, General Benny Schriever at the Western Development Division in Los Angeles initiated the Discoverer program. Eleven months after the go order, the first Discoverer satellite was launched. Eleven months. Now let's look at the first 14 Discoverer missions. Interestingly enough, if we were to talk about 14 missions in a series today, we'd be talking in a time frame of about 25 years, but not for Schriever and Discoverer. For this program, launch number 14 came exactly 18 months after the first launch. What's even more amazing and bears on our discussion of risk is that the first 13 launches in the Discoverer series were abject failures. Rockets failed, satellites failed, components failed, recovery failed, but through it all the team persisted and on the 14th launch attempt the complete system worked. In today's risk-averse world, the discoverer failures would have played out across the news and in the halls of government, and it's unlikely in the extreme that Schriever would have gotten beyond failure number three. We have to change this. Innovation, speed of decision, and healthy risk management can overturn the malaise of the present. As noted, our adversaries aren't afraid to fail, nor are our commercial partners we should be no less bold moving to the future. What then does that future look like? I would posit that it looks a bit like our storied past with a little bit of new and entrepreneurial mixed in. It looks like the chain home team testing at Daventry in 1935 and having war winning technology in place for the Battle of Britain. It looks like SpaceX failing time and again with Falcon 1 and Falcon 9 and the first stage recovery efforts, then succeeding spectacularly. It looks like Planet turning manufacturing on its head and producing constellations of doves without regard to how it was done before. It definitely looks like Schriever and the Western Development Division failing and trying and failing and trying again and again and finally succeeding. Throughout this talk, I've given a few examples from history, and there are dozens more. And I've cited specifically a mere handful of innovative commercial companies, and there are literally hundreds more, many in this room. As we look ahead to the how, two intertwined tracks become prominent. Internally, we must empower our people. We must reward thoughtful, autonomous action taken by tactical leaders. We must be willing to take risks and to fail. We must innovate and move fast in the pursuit of necessary capability. Externally, we must expand partnerships between the civil, commercial, and security sectors. We must adopt industry best practices. We must seek lower cost solutions faster. We must refresh technology more often. And most importantly, 
we must balance risk while staying ahead of an ever-advancing threat. Knowing what was accomplished here over 80 years ago that led to the victories in the skies overhead gives me great hope that we will continue to drive on innovation, seek ways to shorten timetables and incorporate agility, and most importantly, banish the risk aversion from our culture. The heroes of our past demonstrated it, our commercial partners live it, and the promise of our future demands it. Thanks again to our colleagues at RUSI and our friends and partners in the MOD for this opportunity.